we've got a great visualization already, but waiting for a particular year to show up gets pretty boring. In this section, we're going to add some user controls to make our visualization easier to use. We're mostly going to focus on animation controls, but we'll go through some other ideas to make improvements. After we're done, we're going to have an animation that can be sped up, stepped through, jumped through, paused, and even reversed. But first we have to take care of a few holes we dug ourselves into in the last section. Our implementation makes it difficult to fast forward because the timer's approach relies too much on having a set amount of time between frames. We could fix this by just changing time parameters, but it didn't work too well when I tried. There was too much calculation going on and the animation became choppy when you wanted to jump through very quickly. Reversing the animation would also be a major pain. Our current implementation depends on time, which always moves forward. So we're going to take a cue from functional programming and change our animation so it doesn't rely on state. That way we can draw any frame of the animation whenever we want. More importantly, it reduces going forward or backward to just changing a parameter. First, we have to pre-calculate the frames. We're building a data structure that holds the radiuses of centroids and the positions of sightings for each frame. We open the helpers.js file and make a pre-calc animation function. We'll write some new code, but mostly copy-paste the calculation code we've already got. The function will take UFOs by season, geoprojection, and some centroid stuff as parameters. On top, we paste in the season scale definition, define the start year of the animation, and prepare a base state to work from. This will act as our zeroth keyframe. The meat of our function is a massive chain of functional invocations. We start by looping through the seasons, keys in UFOs by season, and sorting them. Then we remove all seasons coming before our start year and use a dot reduce to make a keyframe for every season and put them together in a massive list. Now you'd normally use dot reduce to produce a single value, but with some creative thinking an array can be a single value as well. In our case, the array is hiding in the dot keyframes property of the object returned by dot reduce. I'll explain more about this when we look at the make keyframe function. And finally, we go through all the keyframes and add a final bit of calculation backpropagating sightings to be removed from future keyframes. This will help us run the animation backward. Great, that's the framework done. Now we need to define all those functions. First, we'll create centroid base state. It will produce the initial state of data for all the centroids. We have this code in the drawer centroids right now, so we can just copy paste it from there. And there's no changes required. Excellent. Next, we'll put the season order function at the bottom of the helpers.js file. It takes three arguments, the season scale and the two currently compared seasons. We used currying to give it a scale and turn it into a function of two parameters. Inside, we rely heavily on dtrees.ascending function to sort first by year and then by season if both years are the same. Overall, the function returns minus 1 if A comes before B, 0 if they're equal, and 1 if A comes after B. Finally, it's time to build the make keyframe function. We'll use the same current trick to give it some base parameters and turn it into a function dot reduce can play with. Now there's going to be a lot going on here, but you'll see it's not too bad. We've gone through most of the code before. Dot reduce is going to call our function on each iteration with the current accumulated result, the current key, and the current index. Our goal is to add a new keyframe to the accumulated result and return it. The result will be an object with two properties keyframes, which holds an array of all keyframes, and sum, which holds the state of the animation up to now. A bit difficult to wrap your mind around, but I promise it makes sense. In the function itself, we first use the key to get all UFOs in the current season out of UFOs by season, then we use group by to go through them and collect a list of cluster IDs that we're going to be touching. We filter out any potentially undefined IDs. Then we have to clone the current sum into a new variable. This is because JavaScript always passes objects by reference and without making sure to clone the sum, our keyframes would all look the same. With that done, it's time to count all the currently drawn sightings. We do this by adding the sum of all centroid counts in the current total accumulation and the sum of all counts we're about to add. Now we can write the centroid update code from the placeUFOs function in draws.js. It first updates all the counts and calculates the normalized count per population ratios, then builds a new linear scale and uses it to generate a radius for every centroid. Great! We've got the centroids calculating. 
Now it's time for the settings. We can copy the code for calculating positions verbatim, but our life will be easier in the future if we add another dot map and give it some more metadata. We give the x and y coordinates proper names and add the cluster and point IDs. Finally, we make an object for UFO data that will hold everything added in this keyframe in the plus property and everything removed in the minus property. We've mentioned the backpropagation of removals earlier. This is where they go. After we make sure to return the result, we're done. Marvelous. We've got a function that pre-calculates all the keyframes in our animation before we even draw anything. Now it's time to write a new draw keyframe function in drawers.js. Once again, we are going to borrow heavily from place UFOs. But the new function will be much dumber, where place UFOs had to think about everything from drawing to calculating time deltas and all manner of things, draw keyframe will rely exclusively on the data we give it. First it goes through keyframe.centroids and updates all of the centroids radiuses to the new values. And that's our centroids animated. Bam! Next we take care of removing any sightings that should be removed. We're certain we're always doing the right thing because we're removing sightings before drawing new ones. That way anything in the ufos.minus property can't clash with anything in the ufos.plus property. We build a selector of all the UFO IDs and remove them. After that we can just copy the points drawing code from place ufos. We have to make some minor changes though. We change the initial SVG select to use a G points SVG element. Change the data we're feeding it to understand that sightings are now identified by ID, not by index in array, and make sure to give each point its ID. Now we can safely remove the place UFOs function. It's given us all that it can and is now useless. Almost done. Just some modifications to the centroids function in drawers.js and we're done done. Well, pretty much, but the rest happens in the next video. If you remember, we moved a lot of the centroids calculation into those pre-calc functions. So we start by removing them here because they're no longer needed. We're left with the code that makes a centroid grouping element and draws all the centroids as invisible circles. Now you might remember we used to sort SVG elements on every frame of the animation to make sure centroids have a higher Z index than sightings. That was taking a lot of time and slowing down our animation when there were a lot of elements. So I found a better solution. SVG handles Z index in order of drawing. If we use a layers approach to the drawing, we can get rid of the sorting completely. We draw an empty grouping element before drawing the centroids. This will be our sightings layer, so we're going to fill it later when drawing the sightings. Superb! We've completely revamped our approach to the main animation, simplified a bunch of stuff and made it possible to jump between frames at will. This way it won't die even if we want to change a frame tens of times a second. Now the code won't work if you try to run it right now, because we're taking care of that in the next video.